By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are bringing you old school magic from a tournament in Dusseldorf, Germany. And the tournament is the Urborg Alliance Plains Pillage. And this is round number one where we will see Alexander with his Kobold deck taking on Peter who is playing a blue and white uh, Lions aggro control deck uh, that I've called the usual suspects and why I've called it the usual suspects I will show you in the deck deck now if you want to go straight to the games no worries there's a uh, check the description below there you will find a timestamp click on the link that says take me to the games and it'll take you straight to game number one here we are going to continue with the uh, deck tech and I'm actually going to start with the deck of Alexander let's take a look at his kobolds and here we see the deck of Alexander from Germany, Alexander's Kobolds. And there is a story behind this deck. He actually sent it uh, to me through Messenger. And he told me that back in 2000, he played at a local game store in Hamburg. Uh, and uh, he, he played against the Kobold deck for the first time. And this inspired him eventually to build this deck. And this deck is a result of many, many different types of strategies that he's tried. He told me he's tried it, for example, with Kelvin Warlord. So he's tried many different things. And he says, you know, it just started out as a fun deck that I wanted to play. But then I thought, wouldn't it be cool to also play Kobolds at a tournament? So how can I make it kind of competitively sane? How can I make it kind of work that, you know, let's say out of the five games, I at least win two of them. And I'm talking matches, of course, not games, but matches. Out of the five matches, I can at least win one or two. And I don't completely, you know, lose every single match and, and, and leave the tournament with an 0-5 record. So, um, you know, he, he started out with the Kobolds uh, and brewed around the Kobolds. And I really like that. I like it when a deck has personality. When you say, you know, I saw that card... It is such a cool card. I want to brew something around it. For me, that is really what old school is about. The connection you have with specific cards. And it's not necessarily the best card in Magic. You know, it's not thinking, okay, I want to make the best deck. I know for some people that is that is the reason why they play. But what I really like is these personal stories. So you've played in, in 2000, which is 20 years ago. And you played against this Kobold deck. And you're like, whoa, what are these weird creature for zero mana for an 01. Why would you play this? And then you're like, wow, cool art, cool story. Um, you know, maybe you even get into the lore of the kobolds that, they, you know, they worship dragons and stuff. I also see a Sheevan dragon in here. So that kind of makes sense. And you start thinking, OK, I really want to want to build a deck around this. I want to see if I can make this work, because isn't that part of magic? Seeing if you can make certain cards work and taking the quality out of cards. Uh, anyway, zooming back into this deck, let's let's just start with the Kobolds, looking at this Kobold army. So you've got Crimson Kobold, Crookshank Kobold, and Kobolds of Kirkkeep. These are the Kobolds that are zero mana to cast, and uh, they are just 0-1 creatures. That's all. They are red 0-1 creatures. And then you've got uh, you've got a few cards uh, in the army of Kobolds that can make them stronger. So the most important card here is Kobold Taskmaster. We see a full playset of Taskmasters. Uh, one red and one to cast. It's a one-two creature and it gives other kobold creatures plus one plus oh. Now, of course, this is really important. It means they can also give each other plus one plus oh. It's the same thing you see with Goblin King, Lord of Atlantis, and all those, those lord cards. So if I have two kobold taskmasters, it means they make each other, they give each other plus one plus oh. So now I have two, two, two kobolds, which is quite nice. And then we also see a single kobold drill sergeant. And Drill Sergeant gives the Kobolds plus O plus one and Trample. Isn't that funny? It gives, <laughs> it gives them Trample, but it doesn't give them any more power. It gives them more toughness. I always find I found that kind of odd. It doesn't make sense, but I guess it makes sense because they're Kobolds. You know what I mean? And then we also have, this is quite an interesting card. We've got the Kobold Overlord, one red and one to cast, and it gives all your Kobolds first to strike. Now, the reason that I'm saying that this is interesting is because Alexander is also playing with four Bloodlusts. Now, Bloodlusts is a card, an instant, one red and one from Legends that gives target creature plus four, minus four. And then you might think, oh, so it's a great card to kill creatures. Well, actually, the minus four, there's, there's a rule on the card that says the creature's uh, toughness cannot go lower than one. 
So if you play the plus four, the bloodlust on an 01 cobalt, the cobalt will become a 4-1 because the toughness cannot go lower than one. So all of a sudden you've got a 4-1 cobalt and because of the cobalt overlord, you know, you can have a scenario where you have a 4-1 first striker. And when you also have the drill sergeant, you could have a 4-1 trample first striker. And if you also have the taskmaster, you would have a 5-1 trample first striker. So all of a sudden, you're, the kobolds, they don't seem that small anymore and they become better and bigger. Now, of course, the problem is that a kobold by itself is pretty useless. So you need these lords, drill sergeants, whatever you want to call them, captains of the guard, I don't know. And you need these, these instant spells or enchant creature spells, whatever, to make them stronger. But it is definitely possible. And you can really see these synergies when you look at this deck, which I really like. Now, another interesting thing here is uh, the direct damage. Of course, playing with red, I see four lightning bolts, but I don't see four chain lightnings, which I think is pretty cool that he's made a decision not to play with chain lightning. So he said, you know what? Um, I'm going to put the four bolts in and I'm going to put two fireballs in. And that's, of course, quite interesting because he's also playing with two Ashnot's Altars. Now, Ashnot's Altar is a card from the Antiquity, three to cast. And what it does, you can sacrifice one of your creatures and then you can add two colorless mana to your mana pool. So that means kobolds are zero to cast. You can sacrifice them to your altar and you get two mana back. And you can, of course, use that and put that into your fireball. So if you've got enough kobolds to kind of feed to the altar, you can generate tons and tons of mana and maybe just kill your opponent with one fireball. Interesting to note here is that he's also playing with four Suchis. So of course, when, when Suchi dies, you get four colorless mana, uh, but usually it's really difficult to use that colorless mana. But in this case, if he uh, does it because Fireball is a sorcery, so he will have to do in his main phase. But let's say you have a scenario where you attack with the Suchi. Your opponent is going to take the four damage, let's say, or going to chump block whatever, but he's going to survive. Then in your second main, you can feed the Suchi to the altar and you get four colorless mana that you can potentially pump into a fireball. So you can deal an additional four damage to your opponent. And if you have more spells and more creatures, whatever, and mana, you can, of course, make a bigger fireball and deal even more damage. So it would be really nice. I'm kind of hoping to see the Ashnot's Altar fireball in this game. I'm really looking forward to that. Now, another great thing um, I think about Alexander's deck is the choice to play with four JM Day Tomes. So not one, not two, no four. The cool thing about this is that he really... I think, looked at his list and says, you know, um, the kobolds are really cheap to cast, so I'm going to have enough mana. Uh, the problem is my hand will be empty. And uh, how, how can I solve this? He's, he's decided not to play with blue power, which I think is, is really nice. Keep it original, you know, keep it tight, keep it um, consistent. I think this, this looks like a very consistent deck. So he's decided not to do that. Instead, he's decided to go for the Jam Day Tomes to draw him extra cards. And of course, uh, Suchi Jam Day Tome is a great combination as well, because when Suchi gets killed, let's say in combat, what can you do with the four land? Well, you can use the four land to draw a card for Jam Day Tome. And in that way, the Suchi replaces itself. So the Suchi becomes better when there's a Jam Day Tome on the board, a lot better actually, because it can replace itself. So that's all, always something that I think you need to keep in the back of your, of your, of your head. Um, we're playing Swedish today and I know that there's some old school uh, players that are saying that's not real old school because you have to play with mana burn. Well, absolutely play with what you love to play, but there's just the, the thing, even if you play with mana burn, Suchi is still a good card, but you have to have a few mana sinks. Mishra's Factory is also a full place that in this deck, by the way, is a great mana sink, but also Jam Day Tome. Jam Day Tome is, of course, a better mana sink because you get to draw a card back. The problem is you have to have them both in play if you want it to work, which usually is a problem. But I think in the deck of Alexander, it's not going to be a problem because he's got four off. Then there are two enchantments in this deck that I think that are going to be really strong against the deck that he's facing today because he's facing a deck that is playing almost every color. I think it is playing every, every a card from every color in Magic. So um, his opponent, Peter, is playing a lot of dual lands as well. And there we see the two uh, Blood Moons. So there's two Blood Moons. They can be decisive in this matchup. So it's going to be interesting. I think I think Alexander really has a chance with this deck. He is, he is taking on 
a very serious tier one deck. Uh, that um, you know what? Let's let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, the uh, blue and white deck that I've called the usual suspects. Let's take a look. And now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Peter. And Peter is playing with a, a mainly blue and white deck. Um, that I've called the usual suspects. Unfortunately, I don't have a nice deck photo, but I kind of know what the deck is about. So I can kind of take you through and, and talk you through the idea of the deck. So it's got an aggro component, uh, very cheap creature, Savannah Lions, full play set, Surrender Befreed, full play set, and then it's got a full play set of Mistress Factories. So these are really cheap creatures to cast. I mean, Mistress Factory isn't even a creature, but it, you can turn it into a creature. And um, the, the plus side of that is it enables uh, Pater to kind of keep his uh, cheap control spells in hand and respond to whatever his opponent is doing. So he can keep his counter spells, his swords, his disenchants, you know, he's got that package. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why um, I've called it the usual suspects, because you see a lot of uh, usual choices, you know, Surrender Befreed being one of the better creatures in the format. Um, so a lot of people play with the full play set of those. Counter spell sorts to Plowsiers, Disenchants. Now you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that those are very powerful spells uh, and they're good spells. I play with them a lot as well. So it's an auto include in a lot of decks. And then we see the all the restricted cards. I believe this deck has all or almost all the restricted cards. So in that bottom row, I you just see a couple, but he's also playing uh, I believe with the Time Twister, he's also playing with the Time Walk, he's also playing with the Demonic Tutor. So you've got uh, a Mind Twist, Wheel of Fortune, Regrowth, Balance, uh, Brain Geyser. So basically all the restricted cards and the Complete Power 9, which is also the restricted, um, he's put it all together in a deck, which is, uh, it, it's pretty common, you see it more often. And um, that's also, again, back to the reference, the usual suspects. It's really, this is really um, a deck a deck that makes sense. If you would if you would start playing out and you would have all the cards in old school and you would say, I wanna build a deck that is, you know, just as competitive as it can be, most people will probably end up with with a deck like this. And, and, and decks like this also, tend to, to do very well because uh, it's a combination between aggressiveness, you know, you've got your cheap creature spells to, to, to kind of deal early damage and put pressure on, but it also has those very powerful control elements that um, do not only counter what your opponent is doing or destroying what your opponent is doing, but they also give you card advantage. Uh, you know, think of a mind twist gives you card advantage, ancestral recall gives you card advantage, you know, so the, the power cards they kind of skip, you know, they skip a beat and they, or, or you get ahead on tempo or you get ahead uh, with, with cards. So that's usually the MO of the power cards and the restricted cards. It's kind of a little trick to get ahead in the game. And um, they're absolutely cool and powerful cards and they're restricted for a reason. So it's really interesting to see how a tier one deck like this is going to to do against a more you know creative kobolds deck where i think the kobolds deck can win if it goes faster in my opinion if it goes faster than uh Peter's deck if it um it has burn so it can play a huge fireball and if if you don't have an answer to a huge fireball that's always a problem so you can always lose from the burn component in the kobolds deck and the kobolds deck is going very quickly um, but then again, when I look at this deck, it's so powerful, you know, full power nine. Uh, it's got all the answers. It's playing with the best cards from every color. So yeah, it's 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 looking really tough for the Cobalt. On the other hand, I did mention the, the Blood Moon uh, earlier when it was going through Alexander's deck. And I think the Blood Moon is a big problem here for... Uh, for Peter, uh, on the other hand, um, he does play with uh, a Mox Pearl, so and with the Black Lotus, I believe. So if he has a Disenchant in hand, he can always draw into a, a White Source, a White Artifact Source, or maybe he already has it on the board, and then he can simply Disenchant the Blood Moon. And of course, he's got Counter Spells for the Blood Moon. But you know, in Magic, it's all about when do you draw what spell and when do you draw what card. And that's, of course, what makes the game interesting. So it's going to be really tough for the Kobolds deck. 
but I think it's also going to be tough for the usual suspect deck because uh, Kobolds can be really, really quickly and direct damage is always risky. Anyway, enough, enough deck tech, enough talk about the decks, about what these players want to do. Uh, let's just go to the games. Let's dive in there. Let's go to game one of the Urborg Alliance Plain Spillage 2020. Game number one, and we've got the Kobolds player on the left, and on the right, we've got the blue and the white player, Peter. And it looks like it's the Kobold player on the player, Mox Ruby and a Hammerheim. Interestingly enough, not a Kobold, and there's a Savannah Lines here by Peter. So early pressure here. Will we see something like a Lightning Bolt? Not yet. And there is a Mishra's Factory, probably gonna swing in here for two. Let's see, no response, gonna drop down to 18. And will there be a Suchi? There is a Suchi. Question is, will there be a Disenchant? Not a Disenchant, it seems, not a counter spell. We do see a Mana Drain there in hand from uh, Peter, but of course he doesn't have two blue to actually use it. And now he's a little bit stuck. He really needs or a Disenchant or a Swords. There we see a disenchant, that will do it, and then he can swing in. Remember, no mana burn because of Swedish. But two more damage here for Alexander. So it's going to 16, finding a second Suchi. And let's see, what can his opponent do? Can he find another answer? His deck is really about the answers. He could also choose to animate a factory. Okay, so he's going to go for the swords. That makes sense, going to go back to 20. That Suchi is removed from the game. I don't think it's very relevant, but still attacking here for four, pumping it, dealing five damage. He's gonna go down to 15. Another Suchi. Suchi number three, really? Wow. Basically, all that uh, Alexander is doing here is just playing out Suchis. But hey, why not? Because every time he's kind of forcing Pedro to come up with an answer. What he can do, of course, is attack with one factory. Oh, mind twist. Ay, that is brutal. This is going to be really difficult now for Peter. Of course, he has that 4 4 Suchi, but he needs an unblocking duty, although he's attacking with it right now. Look at that. Peter dropping to 16. There is a Cobalt and um, 0 1 creature for 0. And you see Peter kind of checking it out, thinking, like, Whoa, what's this? I don't see this often. What is this? There he attacks with the 2 1. And we see him drop to 13. And there is a Sarah Angel 4-4. And this is making it really difficult. We do see a Blood Moon here, which is quite nice. Because Peter cannot do anything anymore. Look at that Blood Moon. Wow. That means he's completely stuck. But I think the Sarah Angel will kind of do it for him. Because remember, Alexander has zero cards in hand. There we see a Mox Jet. And he's probably going to attack now for four. Yeah, of course, why not? Also with the lion, so he's, he can deal six damage. There we see a chump block here. That means Alexander's going down to nine. And it's kind of hard to see the dice of Peter, but he is on 12. So he's probably going to attack and then he will drop to eight because I don't think Peter will block here. Remember, I mean, Alexander does have a red deck, of course, so he is playing with a lot of burn. So, you know, maybe he can hit him next turn, bring him down to four. Who knows, you know, everything's possible still. And I think this is difficult for, for Peter as well. Of course, he can he can chump once with the lines. First, he's going to attack for six, which I think is a good decision because he's going to drop to three. That means that next turn he can probably finish him off. But playing against Burn, you never know. And he is attacking here. So now Peter has to make a decision. I think he has just has to take the damage, take the risk. If he has a land and fireball in hand, it means game for Alexander here if Peter decides to take the damage. He's on eight life, and you can see him being in the tank here and deciding to block, not willing to take the risk. And that's it's understandable. It's understandable. Oh, and there we see a black lotus, and he has that mana drain in hand, so he can just attack. Keep his Black Lotus open to use his Mana Drain if Alexander has any burn. And I, th I that would be my strategy. But hey, I, I, I'm, I'm, not in, uh, I'm not playing the game here. And there we see Alexander finding Soul Ring, passing turn here. And this, is this it? This is it, two mountains in hand here. But wow, it was kind of risky still. That moment where Peter had to decide, am I gonna block the Suchi or not? 
Um, yeah, interesting first game. So these players are going to go dive into their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game uh, number two. Game number two here, and it's the Cobalt player who's on the plate. Looks like uh, Peter is taking a mulligan, perhaps, or he's still shuffling. We'll just have to see. And uh, yeah, that Blood Moon was kind of in that kind of made the game interesting. I really thought after that mind twist, it was all done for for Alexander, but that Blood Moon kind of helped him, and and he's still he's still almost won the game in the end which is which is quite surprising actually and let's see there are seven cards here for Peter so now we can see if he actually took a mulligan or not at least he's taking one now we know that <laughs> but I'm not sure if this is his second mulligan or his first one so we'll just have to see shuffling again I think there were no lands in hand there for Peter so very unlucky with that and um, what is actually your your best shuffling technique? Do you always, when you take a mulligan, do you always like count it out like in, in, in stacks? You know what I mean? Like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, make stacks of seven. And, uh, or I should say seven stacks. Anyway, l let me know what's your, what's your favorite way to, uh, to shuffle. Uh, and, and we do see a double mulligan here from Peter. So he's actually starting with five cards in hand. So... That is not a great start um, for Peter. And again, we see Alexander not opening with a Cobalt. And actually not opening with a creature at all. He does have a good opening, but this is interesting. I like this, the rack. Uh, that is a very cool inclusion. Uh, probably came from his sideboard. And I mean, it makes sense because he's playing against this very quick deck that just wants to empty the hand with a lot of threats. And um, yeah. I like this. Interesting here that uh, we see Alexander is not finding a land, I assume. That's why he's playing a Maze of If. Obviously, Maze of If is a land, but it doesn't produce any mana. And there we see City of Brass into a Chaos Orb. And we see a mountain here. So he's, he's found a mana producing land. Attacking again for two. And he's taking the damage, going down to 15. I kind of thought maybe he's going to flip on the on the factory, but of course I do see his hand. I think there's a swords there, so he can always use the swords next turn, or disenchant actually. So that's probably why he didn't want to use his chaos orb. There we see a cobalt and a 2-2 attack, and probably now that uh, disenchant that we saw. Yeah, there's the disenchant. And that means that Peter's taking damage from the City of Brass, going to 14 now. And he's very light on cards because he only started with 5. Remember that, he took a double mulligan here. And he's attacking now with the 0-1. And yeah, there we see the Bloodlust. And that means that he's going to take 4 damage. And we'll drop down to 10. And the Bloodlust is quite nice because it's also a difficult situation now for... Will we see... A, okay, we see a counter spell on the Bloodlust. But the the thing here for Peter is, and that's probably why he was um, not sure if he wanted to counter, is he, he now took two damage from his own City of Brasses. So he went down to 12, uh, even though he countered the Bloodlust. So he's not taking four damage, but he's still taking two damage. So it's, it's not ideal... And I think it's going to be interesting for, for Alexander. Maybe he's holding a Suchi and that's why he's not using the Strip Mine. Because using a Strip Mine could definitely be worth a consideration right now. Taking out one of his the City of Brasses of, of Peter. Because then he wouldn't have been able to counter this spell. Or maybe or maybe Alexander thought, you know what, if you counter it, I trade a counter spell for, blood, for Bloodlust, which is pretty good. And you take two damage anyway, which is actually a pretty good trade for Alexander. And there we see a Mishra's Factory, which is which is pretty nice. It gives Alexander or Peter at least the option to block here if Alex attacks. But this is a strange, strange game, very open game. There we see Ashnot's Altar. So the card from the Antiquity, so you can sacrifice a creature to it to get two mana. And here we see that sinkhole. And, or not sinkhole, but um, strip mine being used on the Mishra's factory here. 
taking two damage again. So I believe he's going down to 10. It's really hard to see the dice from there. Actually, it's impossible, but he's on 10 life right now. And because of the surrender, he will take one damage every turn. And I mean, Alexander has a Mishra's or a Maze of If. So I'm not sure if this was the best play because that Maze of If, it means he's slowly killing him. Again, he's taking damage. Oh, Red Elemental Blast. This was really important, this Red Elemental Blast coming in from the sideboard. And okay, he's gonna flip on the Maze of If. Now it makes sense. He's flipping on the Maze. That means it's gone. And now he can start putting some pressure on. Now, I believe Peter at this point in the game is on nine life. And every turn he's going to take an extra damage. So he's going to go to eight next turn. But of course, uh, Alex doesn't have an answer for the surrender at the moment. And look at that, a fireball. I, is he dead? Was he actually on? Wait a minute, he can now deal six damage. That means he's going to go to two. Because he was on eight and not on nine. Because he already took first damage from the surrender. He's going to go to one. Is Alex going to pull this off? Is he going to win? And will we see a third game? I do see a Swords. The problem is... Yeah, the problem is Peter can only play the Swords of Plows here by using a City of Brass and he's only on one. So then he'll take a damage. So, wow. Ho, oh, ho. Oh. Alexander winning here with that Ashnot's Altar uh, Fireball combo that we talked about in the deck deck. So it's really sweet to see that happen. That means it's a 1-1 one, one here. So both players are going to get ready for game number three. Game number three, one, one here, exciting stuff. Peter gets to start. Of course, he had the double uh, mulligan in game two. So I think if he can just keep his opener, I think he's favored, but we'll see, uh, we'll see. It was really nice to see Alexander win that second game with the fireball. And it looks like he's keeping, starting with the Mishra's factory. And there we see, oh, look at this. This could be interesting. Black Lotus, Mox Ruby, Mountain, Cobalts, Soul Ring. <laughs> oh, this is insane. What a start here. I mean, it almost his whole hand is empty. And I think the most important part of that whole opener is the Blood Moon. The Blood Moon is really wrecking Beta right now. I mean, he's got two basic mountains now because of the Blood Moon. He can be, he can do nothing. He can do absolutely nothing. He needs to draw into a Mox Pearl or a Black Lotus to get rid of the Blood Moon. That's what he needs to do. And there's an early Suchi on the board dropping to 16 here. I mean, he's got four basic mountains because of that Blood Moon. Oh no, oh no, oh no. He's gonna get wrecked. He's gonna go to 12 now. That Suchi is doing serious business and the Jam Day Tome is also great right now because he's got a lot of mana with that Soul Ring. Exactly. Oh, oh, he's playing another one. I thought he would activate it, but he's finding another Suchi. No need to draw cards here. Just playing another threat. He's on eight. Is this going to be one of those super ridiculously short games? We see a Mox Jet here on the side of Pater. That's not going to exhale. Oh, he's winning it. I mean, wow. I didn't see this coming. What an opener by, by Alexander. Turn one, Blood Moon, and that completely wrecked all the plans of Peter. I, I think if it, I, it's my opinion, but let me know in the comments below. If, if you play this match 10 times, I think the, the blue and white deck is going to win 9 out of 10 times. That's my opinion. And I'm not saying that the Kobold deck is bad, but that's just my opinion. Because the deck of Peter has so many answers, has, you know, fully powered, has... It, it, it just has a lot of diversity and Alexander's deck is more uh, a, a one strategy plan, which is, as we can see, working out really, really well. So congratulations, Alexander, winning your first match here uh, at the tournament here, the uh, the Urborg Plains Village. Um, congratulations. Now, if you want to see more of this tournament, stick around. I will have an update every week. So that means that every Tuesday, I will post a new movie here from uh, from this tournament in Dusseldorf, Germany. Now, if you want to support the channel, if you like this type of content, uh, you can help me out by uh, leaving a like, leaving a comment, subscribing to the channel. If you're not subscribed yet, all that stuff helps and is completely free for you to do. Another thing that helps is do not use an ad blocker. The ads, they make a little bit of income. Uh, so you support me by not using an ad blocker. I do understand they're annoying, but hey, you know, 
you support the content creator. Um, another thing you can do is you can become a sponsor of the show and you can do that by joining me on Patreon. So you can become a patron of Timmy Talks. There's probably a card, an info card popping up right now. You can click on the info card and that will take you to Timmy Talks Patreon page where you can check out what you can do to support the show and already starts with $1 a month. Talking about Patreon, um, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at the fantastic, amazing patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het als vinkertjes zomba kan zien.